And this morning we've got Ella Young, one of our members who only joined our U3A in October 2020 and has been an active member ever since. And she's attended many of our Zoom sessions and she's led presentations on her mm -hmm. lockdown project, her very own poetry book, which she had published. A real achievement, Ella, that was brilliant. She gave us a fabulous session on Exmal, um, Christmas in the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and bird song and the golden chorus as well. So as I was saying, Ella's done a number of presentations for our U3A over Zoom, which has been absolutely fantastic. And in the short time that Ella's been a member, she's also become a group organiser of a discussion group and the Topsham Book Club too, which is absolutely fantastic. Now for this morning's presentation, Ella will give us some details about Charles Darwin's childhood, his student years and his wife and family. And she's going to use his own words from his journal to describe some of her pictures of the Galapagos Islands. A great follow-up to Dr. James Taylor's talk in the pavilion on the voyage of the Beagle. So thank you very much, Ella. Thank you. I'm sure you're all aware of COP26 coming up and we need to reduce our carbon footprints. And by far the easiest way to do this is when I share the screen, um, you just turn off your video and then you're saving a lot of electricity and uh, nobody could see you anyway because the screen is shared. <laughs> so let's share screen and let's go. <clears throat> so Thank you. I'm going to divide um, this talk really into two halves. And I'm afraid the first half is going to be a lot of talk and not many pictures because there are not many pictures from the 1820s apart from some portraits and so on, which you saw a fortnight ago from James Taylor. Um, and the second part, the pictures will go much faster and I hope some of the words will be Darwin's own words. Oh, I'm sure before you go on holiday, you do a lot, or you, some of you do a lot of reading about where you're going. And uh, I read this massive biography, which absolutely fascinated me but we're not really dealing with the second half of his life um, because um, I'm doing a follow on to the voyage of the Beagle. And I didn't read all of that, but I did read his journal in the Galapagos and he does write beautifully as you'll see. As far as I know, there's only one film about the life of Darwin and quite how sensationalized it is. Um, I'm not sure, you might be able to get it from the library. I've got one copy. Uh, it's based on a book called Annie's Box. And I like it because it shows their very happy relationship with their children, in particular Annie on the, on the right. Uh, and it also shows his lifelong poor health um, and his nightmares and hallucinations. Um, and it, it, we've never found out what caused it. Originally, people said it was Chagas disease, but James Taylor told me that it definitely wasn't. And I can't help wondering whether it was psychosomatic because Emma, his wife, was very religious and basically didn't like what his discoveries um, were showing, nor did the vicar, nor did the whole of the church going Victorian society. So one wonders whether it was some tropical bug or whether it was partly psychosomatic. So, um, I'd, I'd, I'd just have a, a quick glance at this. I mean, his childhood uh, was pretty miserable. First of all, um, his mother who taught him about flower structure died when he was eight. And then he was packed off to, um, to boarding school at Shrewsbury School. And really they just studied Latin and Greek, which didn't interest him at all. And um, anyway, I'll come to, to a bit more about that later. And um, then his father decided he should be a doctor as he was. 
and sent him to Edinburgh and we'll see why he gave that up. And then as he didn't want to be a doctor, he thought he'd send him to be a, a kind of naturalist um, cleric like Gilbert White and that didn't work uh, until the Beagle, which obviously made the whole of his life. Um, and then we come to his, his marriage um, and then his large family and then the death of Annie, which is very much highlighted in that, that film, and then, and then the book. So as a child, as many small boys do, he loved collecting things. Uh, he collected shells, he collected flowers, he collected pebbles, um, the wax seals they used on their letters, minerals. But most of all, he had a very beloved elder brother called Erasmus, and they had fun doing chemistry experiments in the garden shed, much more fun than Latin and Greek school. So you've seen this picture before. Um, Charles wrote about his father, Robert Darwin, the biggest man I ever met. And he was very ambitious for his children. And he was so disappointed that when Charles was only regarded as average at Shrewsbury School, he removed him from school two years early in June 1825. And this is what he wrote to his son. You care for nothing but shooting dogs and rat catching, and you will be a disgrace for yourself and all your family. So when he took him away from school, uh, he had him accompanying uh, him on his doctor's round as an apprentice. And... Um, Charles really relished his father's approval and apparently had a quite a good bedside manner and even had patients of his own, uh, women and children in Shrewsbury. I mean, can you imagine a uh, totally unqualified 16 year old? He noted down the symptoms and um, his father wrote the prescriptions and he, and he took them back. <clears throat> really <laughs> unbelievable. Okay, so now we come on to Edinburgh. Um, he was, as I said before, he was a great buddy and friend of his elder brother Erasmus. Um, and Erasmus was already partly trained as a doctor and joined him in Edinburgh. And they had a wonderful year exploring there. But first of all, like his father, he couldn't stand the sight of bleeding he couldn't stand the cadavers they had to dissect. Uh, and in fact, he never learned dissection properly, which he um, noted he regretted later uh, for, in his whole life. I mean, he joined the hunting, shooting and fishing set at, at Edinburgh. He had a good social life. And, um, you know, he started associating with naturalists, he didn't attend the medical lectures. As you know, stuffed birds were a great room decoration in Victorian times. And in the Edinburgh Museum, there was a taxidermist called John Edmonston. And Darwin took lessons from him in how to skin and stuff birds. And liked to just listen to him saying he was a very pleasant and intelligent man. Anyway, you can imagine uh, what his father felt about his, his lifestyle, not studying medicine. But Darwin himself, he said, these were the best three years of my life health-wise. I felt joyful and full of energy. And even though he spent an awful lot of time shooting, he did keep a detailed record of everything he shot and his powers of observation and methodical record keeper were meticulous. So another thing that was interesting at this time when he was in Edinburgh, um, he read Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne. And until then, he just thought of birds as moving targets and nothing else. But then having read Gilbert White, he began to observe their habits and habitats. Now, in the center of this with rather, um, see if I can highlight it. Yes, with rather pale writing um, is the Anti-Slavery Society logo. 
am I not a man and a brother? And both the Darwins and the Wedgwood families were very much in the forefront um, of the anti-slavery campaign. And as you see, this Wedgwood plate was made uh, to commemorate the death of William, William Wilberforce. So this is the George Richmond portrait, uh, which was 1840, so four years after the voyage of the Beagle. And I think it's the only portrait we've got of Darwin as a young man. Um, anyway, he's, um, <laughs> his father has sent him to Cambridge to study theology. And even though he studied classics at school, he can't even remember the Greek alphabet. So he's not able to go up to Cambridge, Corpus Christi College um, in the Michaelmas term um, now because he hasn't got the Greek. So he swats it up and goes there at Christmas. Um, and I mean, he's not interested in theology. He's interested in plants and animals. And um, he admired, very much admired the botanist Henslow and went to his lectures and Henslow encouraged him to study geology. And in fact, it was Henslow who was first offered the position of naturalist on the Beagle as um, James Taylor told us last week, I didn't know that. And he recommended Darwin to go and his father was totally against it, but was eventually persuaded and actually paid for him so that he was able to spend his time, um, particularly when he was able to leave the Beagle um, in doing what he wanted. So he was 22. He had the skills of an inquiring background, knowledge of geology, experience in naming plants and animals, keen observation, good writing, a good shot, and he had the skills to skin and stuff his specimens. And this is what he wrote about the Beagle voyage. It was by far the most event, important event in my life and has determined my whole career. Now, Edna Healy um, wrote a much shorter book than this that I do recommend called Wives of Fame. And it, as well as Emma Darwin, it also looks at Mrs. Karl Marx and Mrs. David Livingston. So it's well worth a read. But um, Emma and her sisters did a grand tour of Europe and uh, Edna was offered their diaries and that, that's been expanded into this book. And you'll see that um, the Daily, Girl, Daily Telegraph says, it's a moving account of the paradoxes of love. Our Emma and her sister Fanny ran the village Sunday school. Um, there were 60 children in it and they didn't go to school at all. So what they learned um, from Emma and Fanny on a Sunday was the only three hours they got, reading, writing and religion. And Fanny was actually Charles's um, first choice and she died very suddenly Again, we don't quite know why we think of cholera. Um, and anyway, he married Emma. And what really surprised me was she was actually 31 when they married. So quite old um, in those days. And uh, they had a lot of distinguished family friends, the Wordsworths, Byron, Florence Nightingale, and Chopin was her piano teacher. And if you manage to see the creation uh, DVD, uh, you'll see her playing absolutely beautifully. Um, and it must have been very sad for her, as for many Victorian mothers, of their 10 children, two died soon after birth, um, and Annie at 10. Um, so this picture of Annie was taken when she was eight. I know she looks a bit stodgy, but <laughs> in the DVD it shows what a lively little girl she was. And she challenged her father to talk openly to her mother about 
the meaning of his discoveries, which he was trying to avoid. So if you can get hold of that, of that DVD, it's very interesting. And um, we don't know what she died of, but probably tuberculosis. And she had this dreadful water treatment in Malvern that um, Charles Darwin liked as well. You know, cold showers and being wrapped in wet sheets for somebody with TB. And um, when she was at Malvern having this treatment, Emma couldn't go because she was heavily pregnant. Um, and Charles was there and he wrote a letter to his wife every hour um, about how she was doing. You know, she was turned the corner, she was getting better, she was getting worse. Imagine that kind of thing, you know, before. Mind you, they did have telegrams, but anyway, they were very, very dedicated parents and missed Annie a lot. Right, here we go. So when uh, the Voyage of the Beagle was sailing here, all the islands had colonial names, Albemarle, you know, Edward, George, whereas now, of course, they've got, they've got Spanish names. Um, all the islands just arose immediately from the sea. They're a string of volcanoes. Uh, they're almost on the equator, as you see uh, here. That's my, there we are. Um, and there's three tectonic plates meet here, so it's very, very unstable. And also four different ocean currents that make the, um, the ocean very, very fertile. Um, yes, so these are the younger islands down in the, in the southeast here, and these are the older ones. And we flew in to Baltra Airport, which apparently was... Um, a US airfield to protect, protect the Suez Canal in the Second World War. And then we went, lost my cursor, we went on a little ferry across Santa Cruz and got on our little cruise ship at uh, Porto Aola. Um, right. So let's pretend that that's the Beagle. And this is the first thing. I'll, I'll try and change my voice for Charles, make it a bit deeper. So... 15th of September, 1835. Considering that these islands are placed directly under the equator, the climate is far from being exceedingly hot. This seems to be chiefly caused by the singularly low temperatures of the surrounding water brought here by the great southern polar current, which is what we now call the Humboldt current. So that's your view as you approach the Galapagos, and all around are frigate birds. Now, sad to say, um, Darwin had obviously seen many frigate birds before because it was only after four years um, the Beagle reached the Galapagos, so he doesn't write anything about frigate birds, but they're always there, uh, even on our little cruise ship, uh, finding a nice perch, having a look out, maybe hoping for some scraps. You can see what a, a gorgeous little cruise ship it is with places to sit in the sun uh, and in the shade. So everywhere you see the volcanic origins um, of, the, of the islands, like this uh, pinnacle rock here. And I have to confess for people who've been there before, I didn't note the names of the islands when I took my photographs, so I can't tell you exactly what islands the pictures are from. Um, so this is what, uh, let's, I mean, this could be from La Palma, couldn't it, last, last week. 15th of September, 1835. Nothing could be less inviting than the first appearance, a broken field of black volcanic rock thrown into the most rugged waves. Now, gradually, you can see some of the lavas breaking down where you've got the paler sand. And then gradually, gradually, vegetation starts to come. There it's got a bit further. It's interesting that um, this cactus is one of the first plants to invade the lava. And it's the home of a mouse. 
which is the only indigenous mammal um, on the Galapagos. I mean, the, the land animal, obviously there's, there's sea lions and seals. And all the other mammals have been brought, you know, rats from ships, uh, goats. This is a mockingbird. And our guide said to us, they're always thirsty. So if you pour a little bit of water out of your flask, the mockingbirds will come. And this is what Charles wrote. One day while lying down, a mockingbird alighted on the edge of a pitcher made of a shell of a tortoise, which I held in my hand and began very quietly to sip the water. I often tried and nearly succeeded in catching these birds by their legs. And this is from his journal as well. The next morning I went out walking. There was a beautifully symmetrical tough crater and at its bottom a shallow lake. The day was overpoweringly hot and the lake looked clear and blue. I hurried down the cindery slope and choked with dust, eagerly tasted the water. But to my sorrow, I found it salt as brine. And the beagle had to go off, um, I think for five days to look up, look for fresh water. And so um, Charles had a chance to stay on land and explore. Now, this is very interesting. It's an aerial photo. Um, white is clouds and green is lush vegetation and the brown is, is obviously the lava. Okay, so this is Charles again. Excepting during one short season, very little rain falls and even then it is irregular, but the clouds generally hang low. Hence, whilst the lower parts of the islands are very sterile, the upper parts, as a height of a thousand feet and upwards, possess a damp climate and a tolerably luxuriant vegetation. And there it is. So again, this is Charles. The tortoise is very fond of water, drinking large quantities and wallowing in the mud. The large islands alone possess springs, and these are always situated towards the central parts and at a considerable height. The tortoises which fre frequent the lower districts when thirsty are obliged to travel a long distance, hence broad and well-beaten paths branch off in all directions. And here's our guide just to show you how big the tortoises are. Uh, 23rd of September, 1835. The staple article of food is supplied by the tortoises. It's said that single vessels have taken away as many as 700. I mean, wonderful food supply, isn't it? Uh, you stick them in the hold, you don't need to feed them, they last for months, there's your fresh meat for several months. The old males are the largest. I frequently got on their backs and then giving a few wraps on the under part of their shells, they would rise up and walk away. But I found it very hard to keep my balance. Now, before I go on to the next picture, look very carefully at the shape of these shells um, over, the, over the head of these two sources. Okay, 8th of October. While staying in this upper region, we lived upon tortoise meat. The breastplate roasted with meat on it is very good and young tortoises make excellent soup but otherwise the meat to my taste is indifferent. Right, remember that shell shape. Now this, this animal, alas, is extinct. Uh, he was Lonesome George, and he was the last tortoise from Pinta Island. And they did find some, a closely related female and they mated and she laid some eggs 
but all the eggs um, were infertile. So um, the Pinta tortoise is no more. And Charles was a bit cross. He um, collected <laughs> some tortoise shells without noticing which islands they came from. And it was uh, at the resident consul, Mr. Lawson, who pointed out that on every island, um, the tortoises have different shaped shells. The Charles Darwin Research Institute, where I took this photo, um, specializes in breeding of tortoises. Uh, they also nearly went extinct because of the goats. You may know that story. So this mystery of mysteries was, you know, was there a special creation or did life evolve? This was the mystery of mysteries. Um, these are his sketches of some of the, the Darwin finches. Uh, of course, most of them he, he shot, uh, he skinned them. And if the beagle happened to meet a ship going to England, they were sent to the uh, Zoological Society Museum in London where John Gould um, examined them and classified them. And this is one of the, the tourist t-shirts um, showing all the different variations there are to that finch. But um, there's been a new Darwin's finch only on Wolf Island in the far north where, oh, sorry. Um, Again, I find his words interesting. One species had been taken and modified, not one species had been modified. Very interesting. So this is a newly evolved finch. It's only been seen on Wolf Island and it's called the um, ground vampire finch. And what they do, as you see, is they peck the skin. Uh, this is a Nazca booby and also the other boobies you'll see in a minute um, and drink their blood. And the extraordinary thing is that they don't seem to mind. If you want to see this, um, the series, The Perfect Planet, which was shown in January this year is still available on catch up. Anyway, um, and there's quite a lot of other things about the Galapagos in it. So you may have seen or heard of oxpeckers in Africa and they sit on the back of African mammals and eat the ticks. And they wonder whether this is what, what happened that these finches used to remove the parasites from the boobies. And then one year, when there wasn't any rain and there weren't insects and seeds, um, they found it you know, blood is tasty and nutritious. So um, interesting to see whether that spreads to the other island because wolf is, is far away. Now, artificial selection was very well known. And in fact, Darwin himself bred pigeons and was very interested uh, in that. And um, they knew all about breeds of dogs, all selectively bred from the wolf. So artificial selection was very well known at that time. This is just a fun picture um, of some of our group. This is interesting. This person here is lying with her hand out. And of course you can imagine the heat reflected from the lava. You probably first noticed the sea lions because the iguanas are so well camouflaged that they're also basking uh, on the hot rock to warm themselves up being cold-blooded animals. And even on the different islands, iguanas have different coloration. Uh, this one is from um, Espaniola, and you see that's got sort of pinkish bits but they also go bright red in the, in the breeding season. Now, 
if you are cold blooded and you have to dive down in this terribly cold seawater uh, to get your seaweed off the bottom, there's much easier ways of doing it. Like at low tide, this young iguana is uh, nibbling off a rock. And uh, you could also steal seaweed from uh, birds' nests. So here is one. He's had his half hour, which is the maximum um, before they're too cold to move, uh, about to climb out. And interesting, you can see one here in the foreground and all the rest have climbed out, mostly um, warming where it's black rather than where the rock is, is paler. Um, so this is Charles again. Their limbs and strong claws are admirably adapted to crawling over the rugged and fissured map masses of lava. Now this wonderful crab is called Sally Lightfoot. And apparently uh, it was named after the Caribbean dancers, both because of its wonderful coloration and um, because it can skip lightly over the rocks as well as change its color. Now, Charles Darwin doesn't mention this at all. And it's an indigenous species only found in the Galapagos. So I suspect he didn't land um, at that part of whichever island uh, that was on. Delightful creatures. Right. So Darwin again. It is a hideous looking creature, stupid and sluggish in its movements. When in the water, this lizard swims with perfect ease and quickness by a serpentine movement of its body and flattened tail, its legs being motionless and collapsed at its sides. I opened the stomachs of several and found them largely distended with minced seaweed. I have reason to believe it grows on the bottom of the sea. So poor old Darwin, he didn't have the lovely snorkeling that, uh, that we had. Here is its cousin, the land iguana. Here is Darwin. When we were left on James Island, we could not for some time find a spot free from their burrows to pitch our single tent. Like their brothers, the sea kind, they are ugly animals and have a singularly stupid appearance. Um, and if you can manage to see some of the Perfect Planet series, um, it shows land iguana on Fernandina slide down the dusty sides of a volcano to lay their eggs in the warm sand at the bottom. But most of them are, are laying their eggs um, in the burrows just, just here. It looks like this uh, iguana is eating a cactus, but in fact, the cactus is in the foreground, Darwin. The individuals can scarcely taste a drop of water throughout the year, but they consume much of the succulent cactus. They eat very deliberately, but do not chew their food. Wonderful red sand on some of the beaches, reminding me of his childhood shell collection. And it was so exciting, you know, every morning uh, and every evening, wondering which island we were going to explore next. And we always had two onshore visits and two snorkeling visits, which was just as well because the food was absolutely superb. And luckily we were hungry enough to enjoy it. You can see the beautiful way the, uh, the food was decorated. Those other cruise liners, I think, are a much more typical size. Um, and goodness knows how what value they had. We were on a, a Bristol alumni cruise, even though, in fact, none of my group had been to Bristol. And we had two biologists on board who gave us lectures. So we were, we were very, very lucky. 
And this is the, the king of the beach uh, waiting for the next pangalode. Uh, you can see the little inflatable coming out. We were always told each morning uh, and each afternoon if it will be a wet landing or a dry landing. Most of them are wet landings because there aren't, uh, or in 2006, there weren't um, you know, proper landing stages. Uh, and here's the sea lion just keeping an eye on us, keeping us under control. Um, one of the rules on the Galapagos, because the animals are so incredibly tame and have no fear of people, is you're not allowed to touch any animal. And this was very difficult when swimming because the sea lions actually come up and want to play with you and you have to swim away from them, which is rather sad. So the pathways are quite well marked, as you see, climbing up and um, you won't make a mistake and go off the path. And where the lava is very fragile, they've built protective walkways to, to cut down on erosion. So as well as the um, inland expeditions and the snorkeling, we also went on panga trips around the, um, the mangrove swamps. Um, wasn't quite so exciting. There were, there were turtles. And um, you may have heard recently as a result of climate change, hundreds of um, half frozen turtles have been washed up at Cape Cod and uh, they've been rescued and the ones that survive have been flown back to Florida. And one wonders, you know, how many more species are going to go extinct because of the change in the ocean currents and the increasing temperature of the seas. Here you can see the footprints as the turtles have climbed up to lay their eggs in the sand, uh, which of course is a favorite food of those frigate birds we saw at the beginning. It's not a very good photo, but it's the only one I got. Now, this is a penguin. And you might remember we are on the equator. So I think possibly the biggest thrill for me was snorkeling am among penguins because they look like silver rockets. They've got air trapped in their feathers, uh, which makes them look silver and they shoot about very, very quickly. So that was a big excitement for me. Um, another kind of reptile, a lava lizard. And we weren't quite sure what this thing was on the beach that the lizard is interested in. And then we saw a newborn pup. So it was a placenta. So again, things like the frigate birds and the hawks um, and any other carnivores would clean that up. But it's very sad, apparently now, where there's a huge human population, a huge tourist population, uh, and all these um, completely tame seals, about half the seal pups are abandoned by their mothers. And uh, a lot of them are, are saved by fishermen who feed them. I mean, I mean they can't feed them milk, I shouldn't think. Um, and this is, that's a show I was really there because I took all the other photos. <laughs> I'm not in any of them. And, um, I think the sea lions were there first and I lay down just to make a good, a good photograph. Now, if you think of Exmouth Beach, you know, no dogs, um, what is it, you know, May and October, um, except at either end. Well, just imagine you've got all these sea lions on the beach with people with very, very smelly poop. So not a very happy uh, juxtaposition. Um, I couldn't really photograph all the little birds like the finches. This is a Galapagos hawk. And this is a flightless cormorant. And you may also see not so obviously a lot of iguanas and uh, uh, pinching seaweed from a cormorant's nest was a favorite way of avoiding going into the cold water. I thought this was the only bird I recognized, but uh, apparently it's an American oyster catcher. So here is a Nazca booby, 
uh, on its rather bare nest. And uh, you might think uh, it was a telephoto shot and it was right by the path. So one of the things that's so attractive about the Galapagos is, is the lack of fear. And its cousin, the blue-footed booby, um, actually um, dances lifting one foot after the other to show off, as well as pointing the beaks in the air as, as a mating ritual. They don't overlap because the Nazca booby fish further out and the blue-footed booby fish closer inshore, so they're not competing with each other. Now, here are the frigate birds, um, which Darwin didn't write about. He's probably written about them earlier in the Voyage of the Beagle, but I didn't spot it. Um, and here is the amazing mating balloon of the male uh, blows up and booms. And here are some of their fluffy chicks. I'm sure you know that invasive species are always a problem. And um, one finch, um, the mangrove finch um, on the Galapagos is almost extinct because there's an invasive parasite of the nest which basically weakens all the chicks. And so they don't, um, they don't thrive and live. And now there's a, a program of removing them from the nest and hand rearing them um, to try and stop the species from becoming, becoming extinct. And that should remind us um, before next spring, if we have nesting boxes in the garden um, to remove last year's nesting material, which will be full of parasites. Um, okay, next. Oh, the pelicans. Also very domesticated, um, beloved of the fishermen, hanging about, hoping for some offal and guts. And uh, the message hasn't changed. Don't throw rubbish into the sea. And this for me was the highlight, which was to see breeding albatrosses. Um, here were a pair, we were even able to see their greeting ceremony, clattering their beaks together. And uh, they only lay one egg a year. I don't know what happened to that one. Um, and I wonder if you can spot the chick. Yeah, they may have to wait um, for a long time to be fed. And of course, they may wait in vain. So please, when you buy tuna, if you buy tins of tuna, make sure you buy um, the, you know, bird friendly kind. Anyway, don't let's rem remember that picture. Let's remember this picture and also bear in mind that all these beings, plants and animals, have been on this planet much, much longer than we have. And it's our duty of care to try and keep the planet habitable for them. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Wow, what an interesting time you had. And, and, and thank you so much for putting all of this in context. As you said, that follows on beautifully from the, uh, the talk that we had from, uh, from James Taylor, doesn't it? And uh, uh, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, well, we've got, we, we've got a few minutes for questions now. Um, let's just have a look. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Anthony Klein has given us a, a, some applause already. We'll come on to that later. Um, I haven't got questions, but I have put for reference. Uh, I was very interested in what you said about the creation film, uh, Ella, uh, and I've put the Wikipedia uh, reference, which tells you all about it. From what I work out, it's not on Netflix or anywhere else at the moment. So I think you're right. I think the only way to look at it is probably via DVD, if, uh, if you can get hold of that from the library or whatever. Um, the, uh, the book about Emma Darwin, the Edna Healy book, again, I put the link in uh, with Amazon. Not a great fan of Amazon, but the advantage of uh, going on that site is you can read the first few pages completely free. Uh, and I think the ebook version is, is quite inexpensive uh, anyway. Um, and uh, the third reference is the Perfect Planet series. Um, and I've just checked on iPlayer, and that's available for a further two months. So there is the opportunity for. Uh, for people to watch that wonderful series uh, on iPlayer. I think there are five, five or six in the series, aren't there? 
Um, so there's five. five, is it? Yes, yeah. I only had a quick, uh, quick. I haven't seen it myself yet, so it stimulated my uh, my interest there. Uh, sadly, they don't stay on indefinitely. Sometimes I play renew the period, but at the moment it just is another two months. So thank you very much. So those are the references if anyone wants to follow that up. But you've actually got the book in your hand there, I see. Yes, uh, I, I was get, going to say I do have difficulty, um, you know, with small print, uh, yes. with these old books. Yes. Um, you know, uh, yes. you have, <laughs> so, um, you know, to get it as an ebook where you can increase the size or even just a modern edition where the print is bigger and the uh, lines are more widely spaced. That's a, that's a very good tip, actually. And the advantage for those who don't know ebooks is that you can just expand the font to whatever size you want. Uh, and of course, original uh, Darwin's original books would be available to download free somewhere, wouldn't they? They'd be in uh, one of the archives. But uh, whether they're readable in that format is a different matter. No, no, <laughs> I, I, I downloaded all of Darwin's um, books, and uh, it was impossible to was find it, what, what I wanted. No, it was. Yeah, I, I think probably what they've done is simply in effect photograph the pages and so you can't really sort of change it like a modern e but oh thank you that saves us trying <laughs> <laughs> thank you right well any questions anyone because that was uh, such an interesting mm. talk i'm sure it stimulated a lot of interest any questions i think there was one about how do you stop invasive species uh somebody Somebody oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I've just seen, yes, here we are. How are authorities stopping any insects or invasive parasites being brought ashore uh, by humans inadvertently? I think I think it must be terribly difficult, um, you know, with all these tourists coming. And I do remember, um, you know, in travels in the past, people used to spray in an airplane, whether it was tetsy flies or mosquitoes or whatever. I, I, I think it's very difficult. I mean, you know, all those uh, original species must have come either floated by sea or flown in. Mm -hmm. But now with, with the human population um, and the tourists, and I suppose, I don't know, they're probably not self-sufficient in food. So they're probably importing food uh, from uh, Ecuador. And I don't know how much this can be controlled, really. I mean, clearly they're very careful regulations about sort of visiting, uh, but uh, as uh, we said, when it's done inadvertently, it's, it, it, it must be a real problem. The same goes, of course, for astronauts who are going onto the moon and potentially Mars and polluting the, uh, <laughs> the universe, but uh, that's a different but related issue. <laughs> um, oh, we've got another one here from Hazel. What do you view about the future of an ethics around tourism? Uh, well, that's one aspect of it, but uh, you referred to the larger uh, cruise boats that, that, that came out. What, 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 what's your view of, uh, about that? I mean, it sounded wonderful what you went on because it's small. You had uh, some uh, really good um, uh, experts on board who could explain things. But as tourism expands, what's your view on that? Well, I mean, for me, it was the most expensive and the most environmentally unfriendly holiday I've ever been on. It was eight flights. Wow. Um, and I did tag on um, a visit to the rainforest at the end. But unfortunately, I had had a side effect uh, of my malaria pill and uh, um, <laughs> had terrible diarrhea and never got into the rainforest anyway, which was actually be part of the story. Um, no, I mean, I think, I mean, the Galapagos holidays are advertised everywhere. But I, I feel personally, I don't want to fly on holiday again. I'm only flying for family visits because my grandchildren live abroad. And, um, you know, how, how can we continue putting all this CO2 into the air and, and really destroying the planet? It's not so much, you know floods and, and fires and drought, but it's the millions and millions and millions of um, displaced people who can't live in their, uh, you know, in the climate. That's what worries me. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, I, I, I think we should, you know, holiday at home or holiday close to um, at least until, you know, you can have planes that don't 
pollute the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, fully agree with all that. Yes, my, my yeah. mine's mine's the generation. You know, when when I was a child, we we didn't have a car. We had two weeks by the sea for our our family holiday, and that was just normal. Yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah. So, okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, we've got another couple of uh, questions. One from Anthony to Timothy from Baron Castle, originally come from Nicopolis. Sorry, Sorry, what was the question? Uh, well, is, Andrew, is Anthony there? Do you want, yeah, do you want to open your microphone and just explain it? Yeah, thank you. Timothy is a giant tortoise who died oh, a few years ago now, and he was 160. He lived at Powderham Castle. He's still buried there um, until about 20 years ago, I think. He was the oldest resident tortoise. <laughs> but That's he amazing. Wasn't, he wasn't from the Galapagos, presumably. I don't know where did he come from. If he's giant, yes, I, no, I, I haven't. I haven't heard of that. Thank you for telling You've us. You've never heard of Timothy? That. No. Well, if you, you always hear the story if you go on a Stuart Line cruise, and you'll always <laughs> mention that. <laughs> <the oldest resident laughs> of <laughs> well, there we are. You see, you've given us yet a further idea, Anthony. Well, uh, let's we'll see if we can. Uh, well, if he was 160 when he died, and that was about 30 years ago, he would be 190 now. He would. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you. We all live and learn there. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, and we've got another, another uh, question from Margaret. Do you know when the last eruption of the uh, Galapagos uh, volcano was, as the islands are on active plate boundaries, as you've indicated? So it's, uh, you know, you've got the plates uh, moving about. Right, let's ask Google. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, did you hey Google? Did... Hey Google, when was the last eruption in the Galapagos Islands? <laughs> Here we are, let's see what comes hey. up. <laughs> hey Google, when was the last eruption in the Galapagos Islands? We've got some nice photos, but no. uh, <laughs> no. we'll, we'll, we'll explore that as uh, <laughs> as we go. I'll, I'll, I'll check Google in a moment. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Is the answer? <laughs> no. Any other questions, anyone? You can just open your microphone and ask direct if uh, if, if you wish. Anything else anyone wants to uh, to raise? I'm just going to search this on Google. Meanwhile, uh, let's just see if we can get a an instant answer here. Uh, oh, right at the top, interestingly, small group Galapagos trips get a free trip catalogue. So that comes right at the top of Google. <laughs> 2020, I think, might be the answer. 2020, yes, I think that's that's right. Oh, well, I've got another one. Vogue's last direction is 1995, but that was an old research. So you're bang up to date then. So you reckon it's as recent as that? Well, you know, with three tectonic plates, um, exactly, um, they're exactly. Always going you to be, know, you're be, right. be pushed up. Yes, and yeah. someone, uh, <laughs> someone asked the question: How often do they erupt? Of course, we all know that, don't we? we all <laughs> find that, and it's a very good answer. They occur every few years. <laughs> so I think that's a good, uh, good answer to uh, uh, appreciate oh, that are. question. Timothy was from Turkey and a Mediterranean tortoise. Thank you. Oh, well, there we are. That's got that sorted. So we all know about Timothy now. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you. Any, any final questions, anyone? Oh, Margaret, were you waving your hand around or just... Uh, no, I was just... No, just moving. Meditating. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, should we pass across to you, Christine? Do you want to say a few words now? Yes, thank you very much, Ella. For those of you who are new to these sessions, um, I usually book speakers about a year in advance. And because I booked Dr. James Taylor and had mentioned it, Ella said that she could do a talk. So she has been in the books planned for a long time. And it's a lot of work preparing these sessions. So I'd like to thank you for that, Ella, because obviously you've had to do a lot of research about Darwin and his family and his background and uh, researching the appropriate um, quotes from Darwin so that they match um, the photographs that you'd taken and everything was wonderful. 
And so I'd like to thank you because you've raised a lot of questions as well. Um, there is a Think Galapagos um, website, which is encouraging people to think environmentally. And in 1998, uh, there was a Galapagos special law by the Ecuadorian government. Um, so they were thinking about it, um, obviously, back then. Uh, it's very important. And obviously, when tourists go to the Galapagos, they try to encourage them to be as environmentally responsible as possible. But obviously, as you say, there's a lot of travel involved getting there and obviously pollution um, from all the um, transport going to the islands. So it is a bit of a dilemma, isn't it, really? Um, you visited, which was wonderful, and you've been able to share that with us this morning, which has been brilliant. And um, I think the best part is that you've given us lots of things to think about and lots of questions uh, that have been raised this morning about the volcanoes and the environment and, and of course, the invasive species. How do you stop them? And obviously, a lot of those species are now well established because they've been there for decades and centuries even because they've come in on the ship. So it's been quite a difficult one for the islanders. Uh, but thank you ever so much, Ella. Um, fascinating talk, um, well researched and well put together. So if we could all give our applause to Ella in the normal fashion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed doing it. I really did. <laughs> and your photographs are really, really interesting. I mean, it's good just to get that sort of first hand feel uh, 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 and to give your personal account of what you experienced. Terrific. Thank you ever so much. Really You're appreciate welcome. it. Thank You're you. Welcome.